Today, we're going to find out if it's possible to give a Mewtwo a moveset that is so bad that it basically performs like a Magikarp. And at the same time, we're going to see if we can give a Magikarp a cheated in moveset that is so completely broken that it becomes a top tier Pokemon in Generation 1. So let's start out with Mewtwo. Last time, we gave this Pokemon only 20 base power moves, and we found that it was still capable of beating Kanto at less than level 100. So how could we make this moveset even more terrible while still keeping it capable of possibly beating the game? Well, after a poll with the community, I decided to go with a moveset of Rage, Psywave, Bide, and Counter. And this moveset is certifiably terrible because it takes advantage of none of the things that make Mewtwo a top tier Pokemon. Psywave, in spite of being a psychic type move, deals random damage between 1 and 1.5 times the user's level. Rage is a move that you can't stop using after you select it, and if it misses even once in battle, its accuracy is lowered to 0.4%. Bide requires you to take two or three hits from your opponent before you can even damage them, and Counter in Gen 1 only works against normal and fighting type moves. And you still have to take hits before you can return damage. So will Mewtwo even be able to complete the game with this terrible moveset? Is it going to be completely luck based? Well, let's get into that run, but now we have to think about our Magikarp. How could we make this Pokemon a top tier threat in Generation 1? A standard Magikarp is complete trash. Its only attacking moves are Tackle and Struggle, and because it has such a terrible attack stat, only 10 base attack, which puts it second behind only Chansey in Gen 1, yeah, it has lower attack than Caterpie or Abra, Magikarp is arguably the worst Gen 1 Pokemon in terms of stats. And yet, I think we can give it a moveset that would actually make it viable for a full game solo run. After quite a bit of testing and finally getting a Magikarp to beat the game with Hydro Pump, Dragon Rage, Bubble, and Tackle, I decided to go ahead and try an even more broken moveset. Spore, Amnesia, Dream Eater, and Hydro Pump. And these moves synergize incredibly well. Amnesia raises our special stat by two stages every time, and because our biggest weaknesses are grass and electric, and all of our attacking moves are special type, this is the ultimate boosting move. Spore is a 100% accurate sleep move, which gives us the turns that we need to get that set up, as well as making Dream Eater a top tier attacking move. You see, Dream Eater is the strongest psychic type move in Generation 1, but it's usually held back by the fact that the Pokemon using it are using a 60% accurate sleep move in Hypnosis. Finally, Hydro Pump, our same type attack move with the highest base damage that we can possibly get. But will even this moveset be enough to allow our Magikarp to match a Mewtwo? Well, let's get into it and find out. And the rules for this challenge are as shown. No items in battle, no other Pokemon in battle, no vitamins, and no changing our moveset. We have to use these moves in order to beat the entire game. A few other things I always throw in, we're running on zero DVs or zero IVs for those of you coming from later gens, so that we have the worst version of these Pokemon, so that whatever results we get, you know you're going to get the same or better when you do the run yourself. So starting out in this one, we're going to get both of our Pokemon and give them appropriate names. Magikarp is going to be Godcarp, a god tier Pokemon that was blessed with the greatest powers that could ever exist in this game. In the meantime, Mewtwo is going to be named Mew Poo, because uh, it's hilarious. <laughs> in starting out in the Rival 1 fight, we can see that neither of our challengers have any trouble whatsoever. Starting out with Mew Poo, it completely destroys the Rival's Eevee because it can just spam counter. And because our opponent's only gonna hit us with tackle and we have good HP and defense, we can just completely wreck this one every single time. Godcarp, on the other hand, has a same type attack bonus in Hydro Pump, a 120 base power move, but effectively 180 base power in the hands of a water type Pokemon. So it's only a two hit KO to knock out the opponent. And because we're actually reasonably fast, this is a very easy battle. But as soon as we leave Professor Oak's lab, these two Pokemon start to diverge. 
You see, God Carp probably doesn't need any optional battles in order to beat Brock. We have Hydro Pump, which is four times super effective, Spore, and Amnesia. I think this is going to be fine. But Mewpoo is actually looking a little bit further ahead. You see, I did a test run with this moveset just to see how far I could go on minimum battles. And while Brock is actually not a problem, it's perfectly viable to just use counter on the Geodude and then use Psywave on the Onyx in order to knock it out. The actual problem came up when I got to Cerulean City. You see, on minimum battles, we're reaching this point at only level 14, and that's too low of a level for Psywave to do enough damage to really take down Misty's Pokemon, and Rage Strats and Psywave Strats don't really work on Rival 2's Pokemon. Add to that the fact that we're underleveled, meaning that we take a lot more damage when we get hit, that means that Bide Strats and Counter Strats just don't really work. And since Mewtwo's in the slow level up group, it's going to take a ton of battles to level up anyway, we may as well just knock out every wild Pokemon that gets in our way, and fight every trainer that we possibly can just to get the extra XP that we need by the time that we reach Cerulean City. So God Carp naturally reaches Brock first, and this fight is incredibly easy. In fact, a lot of fights are going to follow the exact same pattern. We start off by using Spore, and in spite of the fact that Geodude can get 5 full heals, he's eventually going to run out, and because Spore is perfectly accurate, we just keep it asleep, set up our Amnesia, and then it's a single Hydro Pump to knock this Pokemon out. Onyx, because we've already done the setup, is just a single Hydro Pump, I didn't even need to use that Spore, and we easily beat Brock and move on past our first gym. So by the time that Mewtwo catches up to get to the Brock fight, Magikarp is already halfway through Mount Moon. But once again, the fight is incredibly simple. We just use counter every single time on the Geodude, and counter is a negative priority move, meaning we always move second. It's the only move that functions that way in Generation 1, and it means that we'll always get hit by tackle first and then return the damage. This is what makes it better than Bide here. If we use Bide, we have to move first, and then when we release energy, we'll get hit one more time if we don't knock the opponent out, whereas counter guarantees that we always knock it out in the minimum number of hits here. Then on the Onyx, we can simply spam Psywave until we knock it out, and it's just a matter of what ranges we get. If we got terrible ranges, we could actually lose this fight, even though we're completely overleveled at level 11. So as Mewtwo is ready to move on, Magikarp easily takes down Jesse and James, and it's moving on to Misty and Rival 2. Let's start off with the Misty fight, which might sound like a little bit counterintuitive, but there's actually a good reason to take this fight first with Magikarp. Misty has Smart AI, and our Smart AI means she'll never use her water type moves against us, and I think with good setup, we'll be able to get through this fight. Now with God Carp against Misty, this is possible on minimum battles, but it's not great. We have to put these Pokemon to sleep using Spore, and then we have to set up all of our Amnesias. And we can see that even with the Staryu hitting us with Tackle, it did 8 damage, so we're in a 4 hit KO range here. But with Spore set up, we can now go into Dream Eater to recover health, and it turns out to be a 3 hit KO with 3 Amnesias set up. Now on the Starmie, we're definitely not going to learn Tackle, that would be terrible, but we don't have any moves that are actually effective here. So our best strategy is to put Starmie to sleep. I decided to use Dream Eater a couple times just to see if I could recover a decent amount of health, but really, Hydro Pump is the play. Because even though it's resisted, Hydro Pump is still a same type move, and since both Hydro Pump and Dream Eater are using our special stat, it's not like one move is using a better stat in order to do more damage. But this fight really just becomes a war of attrition. As long as we can keep Starmie asleep for enough turns, we should be able to Hydro Pump it down. Now here she goes for Harden when she woke up, fortunately for us, so we put her back to sleep. And then it just takes a couple more hits in order to knock this one out. And I finish her off with a Dream Eater. So, there we go, we've gotten two badges with God Carp. It's not exactly fast, given the fact that we have to really whittle opponents down, and we've always got to do a ton of setups, so you wouldn't really want this for a speed run, 
but in a challenge that's all about beating the game on minimum battles or at least close to minimum battles, this is looking pretty good. So with that fight out of the way, we can take on Rival 2. And this could actually be a difficult fight because he's got four Pokemon, he can use Sand Attack. This might not be as consistent as you would think. So starting out, we just want to put this Spearow to sleep with Spore. We can see Peck does about a third of our health with a single hit. And now once we do have it asleep, we can set up Amnesia, but we're hoping for it to stay asleep enough turns that we can start to knock it out. We get a critical hit with Dream Eater, which isn't great, and it wakes up and it hits a five turn Fury attack, enough to knock us out and give us our first reset with God Carp. Now that's kind of bad luck though. It's not gonna hit a five hit Fury attack very often. Most of the time it will hit like another Peck or it might use Growl or Leer, which don't really matter and we can just put it back to sleep and go back into our Dream Eaters. The reason we wanted to use Dream Eater there was to try to recover some health, but in this second attempt, I'm basically able to keep Spiro asleep the whole time, and the actual play here is to go for Hydro Pump. Hydro Pump would do more damage, but two Dream Eaters does get the job done. We outspeed Sandshrew so we can just put it to sleep, just for safety, and then use a Hydro Pump. Rattata will outspeed us, but we can just put it to sleep, and here, since I took damage, I decided to use Dream Eater. It's a one-hit KO. Finally, on the Eevee, just put this Pokemon to sleep, and we can go into Hydro Pump. It's not quite a one-hit KO, so we're going to need a second Hydro Pump, but it was no problem. Clearly, the first reset was just kind of bad luck, and that happens in these minimum battles runs. You're not going to be perfectly consistent all the time. At about 17 minutes and 30 seconds, we've managed to beat Rival 2 and Misty. Now, this might be a lot slower than what you're used to if you're used to watching speed-based solo runs. One reason is because I use animations. I use animations because I'm low vision and it helps me keep track of the action on the screen. But if you turned off animations, you could cut a decent amount of time off of these runs. But regardless, Magikarp is moving on up to Bill's house while Mewtwo is still struggling back there in Mount Moon, trying to get enough levels that it will actually be able to beat Misty and Rival 2. In fact, at the time that Mewpoo is finally fighting Jesse and James at the end of Mount Moon, Godcarp has already moved on to the SSN and is getting ready to take on Rival 3. So let's see how the Rival 3 fight goes and if we have any resets. So unlike the Rival 2 fight, we actually outspeed the Spiro at this point, so we just put it to sleep with Spore and we've got nothing else to worry about. When you outspeed an opponent with a sleep move, you pretty much always have a chance to get through that fight on minimum battles. If you're not using Spore, there's some luck involved, but here we just put it to sleep, we set up everything, and now we're just one-shotting Pokemon on his team. The first Hydro Pump misses on Sandshrew, meaning we took a Slash, but we took it out on the next turn, and now with Eevee coming out, we can just put it to sleep. We still have full accuracy. I decided to use Dream Eater just to recover health, and it's a two-hit KO. So, God Carp is cruising at this point, and it shows the one stat that I think is actually important for our God Carp, which is its speed stat. The fact that it can outspeed opponents with this move Spore means that it's going to have a pretty easy time getting through a lot of sections of the game. Basically until we get to the late game and opponents actually can outspeed God Carp, any resets are basically more due to bad luck than actually this run being inconsistent. But as we wave goodbye to the SSN, we can see that Mewpoo has made its way to Misty's gym, and it's leveled up quite a bit here. It's gotten all the way to level 20, six levels higher than I was struggling against her before, and maybe this will be enough to be able to win this fight. I actually think the Misty fight will be easier than the Rival 2 fight, given that Rival 2 has so many Pokemon, but let's see if Mewpoo can actually get the job done. So I decided the best strategy here would be to go for Rage, because we don't take too much damage from Water Gun or Tackle, and maybe Staryu can just set up enough hits on us that we get really high attack stats from the attack boosts on Rage. Now when we get to Starmie, the issue is that it uses Harden and X Defend, resulting in its defense going up quite a bit, and Bubble Beam is doing a lot of damage, 13 damage per hit. But here we are getting through this fight. We get down to 10 HP when we knock her out, but Rage was enough at level 20 in order to beat Misty. Now the question is, how do we do against Rival 2? The answer is not great. 
because raid strats still break down here because of the fact that it can use sand attack. And if we miss a single rage, our accuracy is basically dropped to 0.4%. We no longer can hit opponents, which means that once we get that single sand attack, we're probably out of this fight. But what about Psywave strats? Well, Psywave is just going to do random amounts of damage, which means that it's probably possible to win this fight eventually with Psywave. The problem is just that it's not going to be consistent in any way, shape, or form. We're just going to have to hope to get the good damage rolls. And here, where we got a single sand attack, yet again, we just can't really hit opponents anymore. I ended up switching into Rage because I was running out of PP on Psywave, and I had to take a second reset on Rival 2. Back for a third attempt. In this one, I'm trying to use Psywave hopefully just to get through the first two Pokemon, and then maybe I can go into Rage strats if I don't have any accuracy drops. Unfortunately, in this one we start getting sand attacked into oblivion by the Sandshrew. I decided to go for Bide because Bide does bypass accuracy checks, but we just don't have enough HP at this point and we get knocked out by the Rattata. So it's starting to look like we're just gonna have to go level up with Mewpoo because here at level 21 it's still not enough. But we do get a fight like this where we can get Spearow down with two Psy Waves. With just lucky rolls, we do over half to Sandshrew with the first Psy Wave and knock it out in two hits without any accuracy drops. Now we can actually go for counter strats on the Rattata. Counter is affected by accuracy checks, so we can't just go for that infinitely. But now we've gotten all the way to Eevee, I decide to go into Psy Wave just to hopefully be able to avoid any accuracy strats and two Psy Waves plus a single counter were enough to knock it out. So at level 21 we got through, but we can say definitively that this is not a consistent fight. And in fact, to be able to consistently beat Rival 2, we would have to level up a lot more than this. So it took 34 minutes for Mute Poo to actually be able to get through the Cerulean City section, and it's starting to look like this is just a complete runway. God Carp is an actual god tier Pokemon, and Mew Poo has actually fallen to being one of the worst Pokemon in the game. So it might be more accurate to compare Mew Poo to how we did with the Legend Carp run, where we just used Dragon Rage and Hydro Pump, than to compare it to this God Carp, because God Carp is just looking too strong. But even this comparison doesn't look very good because the Good Carp or Legend Carp run managed to beat Rival 2 at only 9.5 minutes and with only 2 resets. So any way you look at it, this Mewtwo is terrible. <laughs> it is getting completely crushed by the early game. But maybe things will ease up later on, maybe God Carp will actually hit a wall at some point allowing Mewtwo to catch up a little bit, but we'll just have to see. Right now, Godcarp is taking down the Rock Tunnel Hiker, the infamous self-destruct boy himself, and with Spore and with the access to Dream Eater, we don't even need to use Hydro Pump here. Dream Eater is 100% accurate, meaning that it's the more consistent play, and it's only a couple hits to knock these Pokemon out, so it's progressing on the way to Lavender Town, while our Mewpoo is still struggling just to get over the Nugget Bridge. Well, if there ever was a wall to God Carp, it's probably gonna be Erica, right? I mean, she has three grass type Pokemon, she has smart AI, unlike Lieutenant Surge, who will just attack randomly, which means this is a fight that could become difficult in order to get through. In fact, in our last Magikarp attempt with Hydro Pump and Dragon Rage, we had to get all the way to level 68 in order to win this fight. And even when we did get to that point, it was barely successful, surviving with 9 HP as it knocked the Gloom out. So let's see if God Carp is actually that much better than the last Legend Carp run, or is this gonna be an absolutely terrible fight? Well, the good news in the Erica fight is that God Carp is faster than all of her Pokemon, which means we can simply put the first Tangela to sleep, we're doing all the standard stuff, the same setup, and we're just gonna use Hydro Pump and Dream Eater in order to knock this Pokemon out. And because we outspeed, this is going to be a perfectly consistent fight. The only way that we could ever theoretically lose this would be if we lost all of our spores, just the opponent waking up the first turn every single time. We did get kind of bad luck here on Tangela, but we do knock it out. And now, as long as we have Spore and we still have some Dream Eaters, we've got super effective moves against the Weep and Belt and Gloom. They're two hit KOs with the Dream Eater, but as long as we just keep them asleep, this is no problem whatsoever. And 
here we're going into the final gloom. We yet again outspeed it and Dream Eater it down with only two hits. We're at level 26, okay? <laughs> we are literally 42 levels lower than it took to beat Erica with Legend Carp. We're still on minimum battles. We haven't fought a single optional trainer and God Carp is completely destroying the game. Like, this is stupid. How is this even possible? Well, it comes down to the fact that, in my opinion, I think there's only one stat that actually matters when you have a God tier moveset, and that is speed. Speed is what allows God Carp to completely crush opponents here. And it's what makes me wonder how a Caterpie with a similarly broken moveset would actually perform. Because unlike God Carp, it's not gonna have the speed advantage on everything as it goes through the game. If you'd like to see something like that, drop a comment and let me know. But just to clarify how important speed is in this run, let's check out the Giovanni number one fight at the bottom of the game corner. Here we outspeed the Onyx, which means we simply put it to sleep, we set up Amnesia, blah blah blah, it's all just the same standard stuff. And here we can go for Dream Eater or we can go for Hydro Pump, they're both perfectly fine. Hydro Pump is a little less accurate, but it will be a one hit KO. And we one hit KO the Rhyhorn, no problem. The problem is we are outsped by Persian and its bite manages to flinch our God Carp, causing the second reset in the game. We just couldn't outspeed so we couldn't hit that opponent. But it's not like this fight is completely inconsistent or something like that. It was just bad luck to get the flinch and flinches can only happen when your opponent outspeeds you. So on the second attempt against Giovanni, we simply do the same thing against the two rocks. There's nothing to change in this section. But once we get back to the Persian, we're just hoping to get better luck and be able to put it to sleep this time. This time we do manage to land Spore on it. We can go into Hydro Pump and it's a one hit KO. So we would have won if we had simply not been flinched that single turn. We would have just put it to sleep and then we would have easily taken this fight down. So clearly, we're only going to struggle in the God Carp run in cases where we're outsped by our opponents. Now, that's not very common in this section of the game, but as we get to the late game, it's going to become more and more common. And those are the sections of the game that I think will finally struggle in order to get through some opponents, and resets will stop being just about bad luck and sometimes be inevitable. But even then, not every Pokemon that outspeeds us is going to be created equal. In the case of Rival 4, his first Fearow does outspeed God Carp, but it doesn't matter. He doesn't have a smart AI, a move that's going to easily knock us out, which means that we can just go into the same spam of putting him to sleep, setting up the Amnesia. Now I chose to Dream Eater him down. And for the rest of the team, we outspeed everything. So we just got to choose which move is going to be the easiest to get the easy KO. And we can pretty quickly knock these Pokemon out. But this is a little bit of a false sense of security here that maybe God Carp is becoming so strong that we can just fight anything without any worries about having to take resets. I mean, we've only reset twice to this point in the game, and both of those felt like really, really bad luck. And it's to the point where, yeah, he can use Quick Attack to do decent damage to us with the Eevee, but we just put it to sleep and we finish the fight on full health. Okay, well, I'll just go take on Lieutenant Surge at this point, right? I mean, he doesn't even have Smart AI in this version, so we should absolutely crush this fight with a single Pokemon on his team. Well, it turns out I might have been a little over ambitious, because Raichu still outspeeds, and a single Thunderbolt knocks out our Magikarp. So I decided to go back and try this one again, because this is clearly just a matter of resets until he uses Growl turn one or something like that, and then we're definitely going to win. But he can just keep choosing the best move over and over and over again. You just don't know, because he has random AI in this version of the game. He'll eventually make a mistake, but... This is one of the things that you have to optimize for. Here he finally in the third attempt uses an XP turn one so we can put him to sleep. We can now set up the amnesias. And now I'm thinking probably even if he wakes up, we'll be fine. And a single hydro pump knocks him out. And this is one of those spots where to be perfectly consistent, we would have to level up more in order to make sure that we outsped every time. But even without outspeeding, we can still win the fight. 
So basically, whenever a Pokemon has a decent moveset, you don't necessarily need to over-optimize the run. And while yes, you could do certain things in order to reduce the number of resets you're going to have, it's just not necessary in order to beat the game, and oftentimes just resetting is much faster than going and training up more levels. But what about when you don't have a great moveset? For example, in the case of Mewpoo. Well, as we go into the Rival 3 fight, we can see that we've massively overleveled, getting all the way up to level 30 at this point in the game, because I just don't have any confidence at what level I'm going to be able to beat my opponents. Here, because he leads off with Spearow, and because he doesn't use Sand Attack with the first two Pokemon, I decided to go with Rage. It ends up being a two-hit KO here on this Sand True, but fortunately no Sand Attack. The final Eevee does Sand Attack me, but I did manage to hit it, so we were able to beat Rival 3. But will Lieutenant Surge be just as easy? A big part of why I've leveled up so much at this point is to make Psywave do more damage. And here it does about a third to the Raichu, but then I decided to try Counter because he can use Mega Punch or Mega Kick and we might be able to do enough damage. We take him down to red health and then one more Psywave knocks him out. So we didn't have any troubles with these Pokemon at this point, but that's not going to remain the case for very long for Mewpoo. But it's going to take quite a while to get through the rock tunnel and get to the next major battle, so in the meantime, let's see how Godcarp does in its first attempt against Koga. Now Godcarp is entering this fight underleveled at level 32, and normally this is a really tough fight for water type Pokemon, because Koga's AI is set where his first and third Venonats will only spam Sleep Powder until you're asleep, and then they'll just start hitting you with tons and tons of attacks. But we outspeed, so we just put all three of the Venonats to sleep, and as long as we can keep them asleep, we've got Amnesia set up, we just don't want critical hits, we can then just take these Pokemon down with 100% accurate Dream Eaters. And this is the case whenever you have a sleep move against Koga and you outspeed, you can simply use this sort of strategy in order to slowly whittle him down. When we get to the final Venomoth though, it is one of the fastest Pokemon you meet up to this point in the game. Now he uses an X attack which allows me to get the sleep on him, but we can see that even with 3 Amnesia set up, it's still looking like a 3 hit KO. I was worried he would wake up, so I went for Hydro Pump the final turn. And so that went really well, but it's only because Spore is 100% accurate. Most of the time when you're here with a sleep using Pokemon, it's using something like maybe Sleep Powder or Hypnosis. And the inaccuracy of those moves means that even though you outspeed against Koga, a single miss with the sleep move can result in you getting taken down because of Psychic, Toxic, and Double Edge. So God Carp is definitely God tier, but as it's making its way down to fight Blaine next, We've finally gotten Mewpoo through the rock tunnel, so now let's see how it does in the Rival 4 fight. This is probably the first time it's ever taken me an hour to get to Rival 4 with a Pokemon like Mewtwo, but hey, that's fine. We're going to use Rage here at the start of the fight, and because the first Fearow can use Fury Attack, which hits multiple times, it's actually a really great spot for Rage, because every hit raises our attack. Now we can just one-shot Magnemite, it's going to be an easy KO here on the Shelter, it's two hits just because of its good defense. We move on to the Sandshrew, it's a one-hit KO there, and on the final Eevee, it's going to be a two-hit KO. So, an easy fight at this point, but this is about to come to a screeching halt, I think. But we'll get to that in a bit. First, let's see how Godcarp does against Blaine. I chose to take this battle because, hey, we're a water type, we should be able to resist his fire type moves if we can set up Amnesia. It's probably not that difficult in order to win this fight, Blaine is just random in Pokemon Yellow. Let's see. Now I think that the Blaine fight in Pokemon Yellow is the most underestimated gym leader fight in the entire game. This is not Blaine from Pokemon Red Blue using super potions when he's at full health. This is an actual challenge, even for water type Pokemon, especially when you're coming here anywhere near minimum battles. Because the first Ninetales gets tons of critical hits with Flamethrower, it can confuse you, Tail Whip is kind of whatever, but 
Even Quick Attack does decent damage here, and even if you get through the first Ninetales, you've still got to deal with his Rapidash using Stomp, Take Down, and Fire Spin, and you've got to deal with the final Arcanine that has a much better moveset here as well with Flamethrower, Fire Blast. This just isn't happening. So that's the first spot where God Carb actually had to give up on a fight in spite of having a type advantage. It's pretty clear that the correct play is to actually go and fight Rival 5, but let's see if we can stay on minimum battles or have we finally reached God Carb's limit. Well, if you look at the stats on the left, you can see that we have a badge boost in speed giving us 72 total speed. And that means that we have enough speed to outspeed everything on Rival 5's team with only the exception of his Kadabra. So if we can avoid getting knocked out by Kadabra, we will win this fight. The Sand Slash is easy, we just Hydro Pump it down. Now when we get to the Cloister, I'm going to put it to sleep and I'm going to use Dream Eater in order to whittle it down. And this is just because it's going to resist Hydro Pump. But really, you could go either way. Here, we've managed to knock it out in three hits. It's on to the Magneton, which, yet again, we outspeed, so this is no problem. Normally, this would be the hardest Pokemon for a water type, but the speed advantage is perfectly fine here. So, I'm just going to go ahead and knock it out. It looks like a four-hit KO here. Magneton is really bulky, but now here's the real challenge. Can we beat this Kadabra? Well... It doesn't attack us, and we put it to sleep, and now Hydro Pump is a two-hit KO on the Kadabra. So we're on to the final Flareon, where yet again, we're just going to outspeed it, put it to sleep, and we've got Hydro Pump. This is an incredibly easy fight, so I should have just fought Rival 5 from the beginning. And with Rival 5 going down, we're obviously not going to have any troubles with Jesse and James, so I just completely destroy them. You know, this is just a one-hit KO fest. And we can move on to Giovanni, the boss of the Team Rocket. Hey, he's just another super easy fight because we can just set everything up and we've got super effective moves. Cakewalk. So now it's time to go back to Blaine and see if we can beat him because basically fighting Sabrina here would be great. She's going to be just really random with accuracy strats. But Blaine could be really, really hard still. We've only gained one level since God Carp has only gained three levels since we tried him last time. We're still going to be outsped, but let's see. Now off the get-go, this is going to look like exactly the same battle as before. We're just getting completely wrecked by Blaine over and over and over again but there's actually a very key difference. Can you spot it? When we set up our three amnesias, we are now able to outspeed the very first Ninetales. And in fact, with one badge boost, either from a Tail Whip or a Growl, we can outspeed all of his Pokemon. But the problem is we level up in the middle of the fight. So all we need to do is use a rare candy to get to level 37. And now if we can just get that Tail Whip or Growl that we need, will actually be able to outspeed his entire team, and at that point, this will be a win. So, is this going to be consistent? Well, no. But most of the time, minimum battles runs are not going to be perfectly consistent, unless you're doing Mewtwo, but they are possible. And in this case, I don't think we need any additional levels. So, in this run, we're finally going to get the situation where it missed Tail Whip turn 1. That's perfectly fine. I decided to just put Ninetales to sleep and set up my Amnesias first so I can survive a Flamethrower. Then the strategy is to use Dream Eater to recover health as needed, and otherwise just spam Amnesia and wait for the turns until he finally will hit me with a Tail Whip. If he doesn't actually hit me with Tail Whip and I end up getting to the Rapidash, that's perfectly fine too. I just need one more badge boost in order to outspeed everything. We already outspeed Ninetales at this point, so it's just about getting that last badge boost here. We get confused, which kind of sucks, but we snap out of confusion, we put it back to sleep. We're just going to sit here and use more Dream Eaters. Basically, whenever we're in a position where it might be able to knock me out, I just want to put it to sleep and just get health back. Now, we don't like when we get critical hits because they do a lot less damage, as you can see, but we're basically pretty close to knocking Ninetales out at this point. And we don't mind him using Super Potions because, yet again, we're just trying to get that extra badge boost. Here we've finally gotten it, so now we can put Ninetales to sleep. I'm using Dream Eater just to recover a little bit of health before I get to the next couple Pokemon because, you know, Hydro Pump can miss sometimes. 
but now we outspeed the Rapidash, and now we can just go ahead and... I just kept using Dream Eater yet again, just in case. We could always get a 1 in 256 glitch and miss an opponent. But once I'm back to full health, basically we just want to knock that one out. We're on to the final Arcanine. I've got all the PP to use with Hydro Pump. Let's see what it does. It is a two-hit KO range here. But just like that, God Carp has beaten Blaine on minimum battles. It used one rare candy, but that was it. So at an hour and 21 minutes of real time, we've managed to beat the first six gyms of the game with a Magikarp. We're moving on to the final two gyms, Sabrina and Giovanni, but before we get into those, let's see how Mewpoo's been doing in this section. As it turns out, while Godcarp was fighting Rival 5, Mewpoo was making its way to Celadon City to take on Erika. Now we have to see if we can get through with Rage Strats, we are very over leveled compared to Erika's team at this point, so maybe this will be just fine. So going into the Erika fight, as with most fights with Mewpoo, my default strategy is just to go for Rage. It's the simplest strategy and if it works, if I can just survive enough hits and I can manage to get the damage output up enough, this is the easiest strategy to get through the game with. Whenever we have to go for counter or bide strats or rely on Psy Wave luck, it's not very good. But here, even with Paralysis, we're doing more than enough damage, we've taken down the first two Pokemon. On the final Gloom, it's basically a two-hit KO, so as long as we don't get terrible Paralysis luck, we should get through this one, and that was just fine. We beat Erika on the first attempt. And now we can take on Giovanni, where we can't really go for the Rage Strat, because here his Onyx isn't going to take a lot of damage from that move. So instead, this is the spot where we go for Psy Wave. It's a two hit KO on the first Onyx. Now moving on to the Rhyhorn, I decided to use Rage here, hoping that it would just hit me with Horn Attack enough times that I would get my attack stat up really high so that when I get to the Persian, I can knock it out with Rage. We can see that this is working. I am taking it down pretty quickly. And on the final Persian, it's a two hit KO. So we get through Giovanni with no trouble. So then the Pokemon Towers, nothing to talk about, so let's go straight to rival number 5. I'm just going to follow the same route that I used with Godcarp, basically just seeing if we can manage to beat rival 5 right here, rather than going and fighting any of the tough gym leaders. And here, the default strategy is to go Rage, well, it does basically nothing against Sandslash. And those slashes and swifts do way too much damage here, so we go down on the first attempt. Now, I attempted this over and over and over again. I tried counter strats, I tried psi wave strats, I tried everything. At our current level, even at level 37, so we're almost at the same level as his Pokemon, Mewtwo's just not getting through. This is a completely terrible situation, and we can get to the second Pokemon with good luck with psi wave, but we're just not getting any further than that. And Koga is not going to be much better because he's going to be using toxic strats on us, which means that we're really going to struggle to get through because every single move that we have is never going to be a one hit KO on his Pokemon. So I think the only thing to do is to grind up more levels. So it may have looked like I was over leveling. Maybe I was trying to sandbag this Mewtwo earlier on. No. We need every level that we can get to even have a shot at getting through these major trainers. So while Mewtwo goes and gains some extra levels, let's see how Godcarp does against Sabrina. This could be tough. Now I cut out one reset against Sabrina because I failed to recover PP before going into the battle, so we're just going to take that one off, it's counted in the score. But here we can put Abra to sleep, it didn't use any accuracy drops on us this time, and I decided to go for Dream Eater here against the Abra just to keep PP in Hydro Pump for the last two Pokemon. Especially against the Alakazam, that's what we're going to want to use. And because we can actually outspeed the Abra after we set up our badge boost, this is just a matter of taking it down little by little. We're always going to get through the Abra as long as we get that first turn without it landing flash on us. 
Now once we get to the Cadabra, it does outspeed, so I put it to sleep and I'm going to use Hydro Pump. Hydro Pump's not perfectly accurate, it's got a 20% chance to miss, but as long as it stays asleep, we should be able to knock it out. Now I did go for some Dream Eaters here, which was not the correct play, I should have just stuck with using my Hydro Pumps here. I was just worried about running out of PP on the Alakazam. So here, finally, I'm on low health, I just go into Hydro Pump, I knock it out. Now Alakazam uses X Defend turn 1, so we put it to sleep, very nice. Now Hydro Pump, how much is it gonna do? A critical hit did so little damage. We need a non-critical hit. If we can land one more non-critical hit, I think we knock it out. And there we go, we have beaten Sabrina on the first real attempt with PP. And now we can move on to Geo. Now he will outspeed us with his first two Pokemon. So this could be really hard, but let's see if we can get the luck to get through. So the Giovanni fight starts off terribly. And it's all because of the fact that the Doug Trio can basically one-shot us if it uses Earthquake or Dig. Now with that being said, we should be able to put this Pokemon to sleep eventually, and then we should have a chance to win. Now with luck, we can get through the first two Pokemon, but we have a problem. We level up in the middle of the fight, meaning we lose our batch boost in speed. That's the only reason that I'm using a rare candy here. I just want to have speed so that I can outspeed the two Nidos because they're both going to use Thunder in Pokemon Yellow. And Thunder, while yes, we have Amnesia set up, it's still going to do decent damage. Now, if we get hit by Fissure, we just have to reset immediately, and there's nothing you can do about that. Unless you outspeed the Doug Trio, you always have a 30% chance of getting knocked out by Fissure. And this is one of the issues with going for consistency in runs in Pokemon Yellow. There's just a lot of spots where unless you're going to massively over level, you're just not going to be able to beat the opponent consistently because there's always a chance that they use certain moves or they get high critical hit chances and they knock you out. But as soon as we manage to get the setup here, I know that we're going to be able to get through the rest of the team. Here, we finally get a turn where he misses a sand attack. We put the Doug Trio to sleep. Now we can set up our three amnesias. And a single Hydro Pump is definitely going to knock out this Doug Trio, no problem whatsoever. We can move on to Persian, where yeah, we don't want to get hit by Slash, but he guards specs, so we just put it to sleep. Here we can go for Hydro Pump yet again, and it's going to be a two-hit KO here, but that's perfectly fine. But now, with the badge boost in speed, we outspeed Nidoqueen, so we can put it to sleep, and I'm using Dream Eater here. I want to save my Hydro Pump PP for the final Rhydon. We'll definitely outspeed there, even if we level up in the middle of the fight. Rhydon's just incredibly slow. We take down Nidoqueen, now it's on to Nidoking, where we outspeed yet again, thanks to the badge boost in speed. So now, we can knock it out. I used one Hydro Pump, but then I went into a Dream Eater to finish it off. Final ride on time, we just put it to sleep, and we just need Hydro Pump to hit, and a single hit knocks out the ride on. We have beaten Giovanni on minimum battles. No optional battles whatsoever. We, we have used two rare candies in order to manage our XP so that we didn't level up and lose badge boosts, but really not too bad. And it's only an hour and a half for this Magikarp to be at this point in real time playing at four times speed. With animations on, that's not a terrible time. And now only Rival 6 stands between God Carp and the League. And I'm starting to think we might be able to beat the entire game on minimum battles with this Magikarp. And if we can manage it without a ton of resets, this Magikarp will end up God tier on my tier list. So let's see how Rival 6 goes. Now we're going to speed this fight up a little bit because the strategy is basically what you would expect. We just put the first Sand Slash to sleep and set up. And now Hydro Pump, as long as it hits, will be a one shot here, unless we get bad luck. I ended up using Dream Eater to knock that one out. Now we put the Execute to sleep, and Execute would be really trolly if it were awake. It could use Leech Seed, Stun Spore, Solar Beam. But here with it asleep, I'm just whittling it down with Dream Eater because it doesn't have great special, and I think I want to save my Hydro Pumps for later on. So here we can now put the Cloyster to sleep. We actually got a Gen 1 miss here, causing us to miss the first Spore. So we got confused, but that's again, just bad luck. And with Dream Eater, we can get back to full health. We outspeed the Magneton. We just need to keep it asleep. Now we can just go into our Dream Eater spam. And the biggest issue that I'm worried about is running out of Spore PP here. 
Now we get hit by a side beam from the Kadabra, but as long as it's not a critical hit, it's perfectly fine. We put it to sleep and now we just use three hydro pumps to knock it out. Finally, we outspeed Flareon. We put it to sleep and hydro pump, not quite a one hit KO, but we take it out on the last turn with a dream eater and we have beaten rival six. We're moving on to the league on minimum battles. So before we go to the league, I'm gonna pick up the last rare candy in the power plant and get a few items just to be prepared. So let's see how Mew Poo's been doing in this time. It turns out that as God Carp was taking on Giovanni, Mew Poo had finally managed to make its way to Koga. And while it is very far behind, it has no chance in this race at this point, I don't think, it is at least making progress in the game. But the Koga fight could be incredibly difficult because he's going to want to use Toxic on our Pokemon a lot, and if we can't find a way to get through him in a reasonable number of turns, we're just going to get completely wrecked here. Koga might end up being one of the biggest walls in the entire run because in Pokemon Yellow, all of his Pokemon can use Toxic. Now you may notice that I've come into this battle poisoned, and that is intentional. I don't want him to be able to put me to sleep, and I don't want him to use Toxic on me. So if I come in poisoned, he can't get the status on me, and I can try the Rage Strat here. Basically hoping that the first Venonat, since it will only use Tackle against me, will do little enough damage that I can manage to get Rage built up enough that I can knock out the rest of his Pokemon. The second Venonat is a 3 hit KO here, but it's clearly just not working. It takes too many turns, even with normal poison to get through, and he knocks me out on the first attempt. This is pretty clearly not going to happen, so it's time to go back to the drawing board and level up. After leveling up all the way to level 45, I decided this would be a good time to go back and try Rival 5 again, because maybe we can just make it through him at this point. He's definitely going to be easier than Koga because he's not going to use Toxic or Sleep Powder on us. And here, as long as we can get through this Sand Slash without getting any Sand Attacks, I think we have a chance. We used Rage this time and we got no Accuracy Drops. Now on the Cloister, it's using things like Aurora Beam, which drop our attack stat, but when it uses Clamp, each hit from Clamp raises our attack by one stage. If we can get to plus six, I think we're just fine. He lands one more hit before we knock him out, getting us to our maximum attack stat. Now we can use two hits to knock out Magneton. It's a one hitter on Kadabra, and here on the Flareon, it hits me with Fire Spin, but fortunately it's not doing very much damage, and we get the last hit, to knock him out. So we have defeated Rival 5 at this point, and now we can just take on Giovanni instead. But I'm pretty sure we need a lot more levels before we're gonna be able to beat Koga. And all of these trainers in Silphco will disappear if I beat Giovanni, so I'm gonna fight them all first before we move on. So in the meantime, let's see how God Carp's doing in its first attempts at the league. Now Mewtwo was at about an hour and 50 minutes when we beat Rival 5 there, and we've jumped back in time. This is currently about an hour and 35 minutes of real time in both of these runs, and it was at this point that Magikarp was making its way to the league. Now, if you're wondering how I did everything in between where I'm doing all these cuts, I always put an unlisted video with the full unedited runs with live commentary. So if you wanna check those out, they're linked in the description below. But as we make our way to the league with Godcarp, still on minimum battles, it's time to make some predictions. I think that Lorelei's not gonna be too bad, and Bruno is Bruno. We have Dream Eater in order to take out Agatha, so I think it's really Lance in the champion that could be walls, if anything. But here, we're just gonna put all of our other Pokemon into the PC, buy the full restores that we need, and it's time to see if Godcarp can beat the entire game on minimum battles. So I was pretty sure that I would need rare candies in order to get through Lorelei because a lot of her Pokemon do resist our moves, so I leveled up to level 50 using rare candies. Now I can put Dugong to sleep because I outspeed, I can set up my Amnesia, and I decided to use Dream Eater here because I want to save my Hydro Pumps for some of the later Pokemon. Basically, when we get to the later parts of her team, things like Slowbro and Jinx, 
Hydro Pump's going to do more damage than Dream Eater, but it's not going to be super strong. We're going to need to use a lot of PP there. So here on the Cloister, we're also going to put it to sleep. And same strategy, we outspeed, so we just need to set up Dream Eater in order to knock it out. Now for the slow row, this is where I'm going to put this one to sleep, and I'm going to use Hydro Pump. Since it resists both of my moves, Hydro Pump is stronger. It's still effectively 90 base power here against the slow row. Here, we're able to three-shot it. Now, Jinx, we actually outspeed thanks to badge boost, and I can go for Hydro Pump here, which is not resisted by Jinx. It turns out to be a two-hit KO. Finally, we're onto the Lapras, but we outspeed. We've got plenty of spores, and we can just go into the Dream Eater spam. And this isn't doing a lot of damage, but that shouldn't matter. We should be able to just whittle this one down eventually, as long as it just doesn't wake up turn one every single time. We're pretty much guaranteed to win this fight at this point. So God Carp has officially been able to defeat the first member of the Elite Four, and now it's time to move on to Bruno. Let's see if we can first attempt him as well. Now in the Bruno fight, we basically come out and already outspeed all of his Pokemon. These Onyx can do nothing. We just need to set up all of the Amnesias and this should be another incredibly easy fight. I made this moveset looking at the Elite Four in particular, thinking about what kind of moves would enable a Magikarp to beat all of these trainers. And here, we've got the Dream Eater. Dream Eater can completely destroy the Hitmons. It turns out to be a two hit KO here on the Hitmon Lee, but then we can just knock it out because we outspeed and we don't even need to mess around. We can just Hydro Pump on the Onyx and it's always gonna be a one hit KO. Finally, we can put Machamp to sleep because we outspeed and it's turning out to be a two hit KO to knock out this Pokemon. Bruno goes down, he was never in question. But here's the real challenge, Agatha. In every run, you're always worried about how to get through her, but let's see if God Carp can do it in one attempt. So fortunately, in Generation 1, even when an opponent sets up Substitute, you can still put them to sleep. Substitute only blocks Poison and Confusion status and things like stat drops from Tail Whip. What that means is that we can basically just set up all of our amnesias. I used a hydro pump to break the substitute and then I go into Dream Eater. And you'll notice I'm outspeeding even the Gengar thanks to the badge boost glitch. Basically, the fact that we have three badge boosts is enough to outspeed everything on Agatha's team as long as we don't level up in the middle of the fight. So we are able to just put all of these Pokemon to sleep and use a super effective Dream Eater in order to pretty much wreck the entire team. This doesn't look like it's going to be too difficult. I'm just hoping not to level up here. We knock out the Arbok as we get to the final Gengar. We're still out speeding. So Spore into Dream Eater. It's a two hit KO range here. Very, very easy win. Agatha was no problem for God Carp. And this Pokemon is running on 28 resets to this point with a completely unoptimized run and no optional battles. But here before Lance, I am going to use a rare candy to avoid a level up in the middle of the fight. But Lance has two Pokemon with electric type moves. He could wreck this run. Let's find out. Now, the first thing to notice in this fight is that we outspeed the Gyarados. And this is the effect of stat experience. Basically, we've knocked out tons of Pokemon as we've gone through the game, and it's raised all of our stats. So basically what you call EVs in later generations. In Gen 1, it was stat experience. So we've gotten enough stat experience in speed that we can actually outspeed this Gyarados, even though we're at a lower level. So we just set up and take it down. But now we leveled up, which means we lost our badge boosts, which might affect this fight. We might not be able to outspeed everything at this point, but really it shouldn't make too much of a difference. Here the Dragonair is just an easy two hit KO. 
Here we can go ahead and put the second Dragonair to sleep, and I decided to just test out how Hydro Pump would do, how Dream Eater would do. Either way, we knocked it out in two hits. We get to the Aerodactyl, it hits a big Swift. I put it to sleep, and I tried to use Dream Eater, but it woke up, and a Hyper Beam ends me on the first run. But I think this is possible. Now, I decided to just go ahead and pop a Rare Candy so that I wouldn't lose badge boosts. Because I'm not just getting badge boosts in speed, I'm getting badge boosts in defense and attack. And extra defense might have allowed us to survive there against the Aerodactyl. So here in the second attempt, I'm just going to put the Gyarados to sleep again. We're doing the same setup here. There's no difference in this section of the fight. The only real difference is that I decided to just spam Dream Eater here and see how much damage I would do. Not use any Hydro Pumps. I'll save those for later. Dream Eater is doing a decent amount of damage here, but it's looking like it's not a quite a three hit KO. I tried Hydro Pump there, but then he uses a Hyper Potion. He can use one Hyper Potion per Pokemon, which is really trolly in solo runs because I have limited PP. And if I run out of moves, then I might just lose by default. I might just not be able to get through this one. But here we've managed to keep Gyarados asleep long enough to finally Dream Eater it down. Here on the Dragonair, I decided to just stick with Dream Eater. It turns out to be a two hit KO. So as long as we can just land the two hits, we're perfectly fine here. Same on the second Dragonair, we outspeed, so we don't need to worry about what their movesets or anything because they're just going down the same way. The one that we're worried about is the Aerodactyl. A critical hit Hyper Beam will wreck us every time, but with the badge boost in defense, Swift didn't do that much and we were able to one shot it with Hydro Pump. Now we can put Dragonite to sleep. We are kind of learning low on PP. I'm not sure exactly what the best strategy is. If we get critical hits like that, it actually does a lot less damage because in Gen 1, basically critical hits ignore all of your stat boosts. So the fact that we have four times special from all the amnesias that we've set up doesn't matter when we get a critical hit. And so we're just really hoping to stop critical hitting here. We're running low on the Dream Eater PP, so I'm switching into Hydro Pump, hoping that I just have enough PP and I get enough hits to knock this Dragonite out. I've got it down to a sliver and a Dream Eater finishes it off. So we had a grand total of one reset on Lance and we are on to the champion on minimum battles. We have not taken a single... Now, fortunately, the champion does have the Flareon team. This is always the case when you run on minimum battles, unless you intentionally lose the rival one fight, in which case he'll have the Vaporeon team. But what that means is that he doesn't have his fastest Pokemon, Ninetales and Jolteon. So we should be able to outspeed pretty much everything here with setup, but can we get it on the first attempt? So here in the champion fight, we know we're going to outspeed the first Sand Slash. So we just need to do all of our setup here. We set up Spore, it wakes up immediately, we put it back to sleep, we're just going to set up three Amnesias here, and I think with three Amnesias it shouldn't matter, a Hydro Pump should just one shot the Sand Slash. It does, and we're on to Alakazam. Here we actually outspeed Alakazam thanks to the badge boost in speed, so as long as we didn't level up before Alakazam we were perfectly fine here, and so we have basically just guaranteed a win I think at this point. The problem is that we are getting some critical hits, and critical hits always do less damage because they ignore our stat boosts. So we ended up using an awful lot of Hydro Pumps right here on the Alakazam, that's not really ideal. I'm gonna have to keep these last two Hydro Pumps in my pocket for the Flareon at the very end. So I'm going to just use Dream Eater here on the Executor and hope that I can whittle it down. It's gonna take quite a few turns to do so, but it should ultimately work out. What is clear is that if you were using a less accurate sleep move, something like Hypnosis here, this would be absolutely terrible. But the fact that we can guarantee sleep every single turn with God Carp means that Exeggutor will go down eventually. We're also just hoping he doesn't use a full restore because that would be terrible. We've got it all the way down to a sliver and we finally knock it out. 
Now we can move on to Magneton. I'm gonna put it to sleep and I'm gonna go right back into Dream Eater. We get the critical hit yet again here. We've just gotten so many crits in this fight. And if he full restores, it's probably game over because we just don't have enough PP to get through all of his Pokemon. Now we're to the Cloyster and we're gonna put it to sleep. We're gonna stick with Dream Eater and it's gonna take about three hits to knock this one out. He doesn't full restore, fortunately. We're all the way to the Flareon. So now we just need to put this one to sleep and we have one Dream Eater and we've got two Hydro Pumps. I missed the first Hydro Pump. I missed the second Hydro Pump. Dream Eater is not gonna do anywhere near enough damage. I could try to struggle this one down, but I decided to just reset right there. We just need to get better luck. We just don't want critical hits. The fewer critical hits we get, the better. So here we are in the second attempt at the champion. We've now hit the point of having 30 resets. We're at an hour and 51 minutes. But if we can just manage to get the setup here, I think we have a chance to still beat the game on minimal battles. And really, it should just be a matter of just getting kind of worse luck with crits, technically, because in most cases you would want critical hits, but not here. Here, once again, we one-shot the Sand Slash. It's perfectly fine. We're still outspeeding Alakazam. We use Hydro Pump. It's looking like a two-hit KO. It stays asleep this time, so we're able to get the two-hitter. We still have plenty of PP in the bag for the Flareon at the end. We're just going to do the same strategy here on Exeggutor, just keeping it asleep. I used Hydro Pump here because I had more PP, but I'm still going to keep at least two in the bag. They're... 80% accurate, we should hit Hydro Pump most of the time. So the fact that we missed two in a row on the Flareon was just incredibly unlucky and incredibly unlikely, but it happens, you know? So here we've got the Exeggutor pretty much taken down. It's all the way down to a sliver. He doesn't use a full restore. We're able to move on to the Magneton. We're this time without critical hits. This is a pure three hit KO. So as long as we're not getting bad luck, we should be able to win this fight very, very easily from here on out. We move on to the Cloyster. It should be the same situation, a three hit KO range as long as we don't get critical hits. Here we get the first two with no crits, perfect. Now the final Dream Eater knocks it out. We're all the way back to Flareon. We put it to sleep. It hits us with a big quick attack, but we did put it to sleep. Hydro Pump connects and there we go. God Carp has beaten the entire game of Pokemon Yellow on Minimum Battles. What does this tell us? This tells us that this is the kind of moveset that a Pokemon needs in order to completely crush this game. Now you might be saying, well this is only possible because you gave this Magikarp the most completely broken moveset in the history of the game. True, but there are a lot of Pokemon that are running very similar sets to this in full game solo runs. Gengar, Venomoth, Poliwhirl, Ivysaur. We've beaten the game already with 18 Pokemon on zero DVs, minimum battles, and with no TMs. And with only the exception of Mewtwo, Slowbro, the one hit KO Mew, and the HM only Mew, every other Pokemon has been running a sleep set with good coverage moves. So what we've discovered is that with a move set like this, with badge boosts, with sleep, with two good strong coverage moves, any Pokemon would be able to beat the game on minimum battles. So ultimately, this unoptimized run of God Carp lands at sixth place on my total tier list, behind only Mewtwo, Hypno, Weepin' Bell, Poliwhirl, and Gengar. And with optimizations, it would easily jump over a lot of these Pokemon. So this is a truly God tier Pokemon. But I know a lot of you probably have already completely forgotten about Mewpoo, the worst Mewtwo. How low is it gonna come in on the tier list? Let's get back and see how it's going. So it turns out that it was as we were putting God Carp on the tier list that Mewpoo was finally taking on Giovanni in Silphco. And it's not a terribly difficult fight. We can actually just use Rage the entire time. Yes, this Rhyhorn is going to resist our damage, but it's also gonna give us a bunch of attack boosts, so we can basically just whittle it down without too much issue. And at this point, we're already up at level 50 with our Mewpoo, 
and still having trouble getting through a lot of fights, basically. We still haven't beaten Koga, we still have to beat Sabrina, we have tons of battles still left in front of us. So I'm gonna kind of speed through these because we don't want to take a ton of time. We'll note the level and the time that we are able to beat each opponent. So it's ultimately at level 52 that we're able to take on Koga with our Mewpu. And at this point, I basically gave up on the strategy of trying to go in poisoned. And instead I got lucky and he put me to sleep and it was a nice long sleep. This first Venonat can only use Tackle, which means that it's only going to just build my Rage, it's not going to do a ton of damage, and we end up knocking it out. Then it's a two hit KO on the other Venonats. We're going to finally get hit with Toxic here by the third Venonat, but we do knock it out. And on the Venomoth, we move first, we're able to hit it. It does heal damage with Leech Life, so it's looking like a three hit KO here, but we are ultimately able to get through and we're moving on. So with Koga going down, it's time to move on now to Blaine. And the Blaine fight really comes down to just using Rage and hoping not to be confused for a ton of turns, hoping not to get any critical hits. And we're at level 55 here, so we've gained just a couple of levels, not too much extra grinding though. Here, we're able to get to the Rapidash, we're no longer confused, Takedown doesn't do that much, we knock it out in two hits, we're all the way to the Arcanine, it's looking like a two hit KO, Takedown didn't do that much, we didn't quite get the range, so there we go, we beat him in three hits. Now on to Sabrina, and this is all about resetting for a fight where she doesn't get the accuracy drop turn one. We managed to get through the Abra in two hits, and now on the Kadabra, it hits with a weak Psy Wave, so we get an extra boost in attack, and we knock it out. She X defends on Alakazam, which is not good, and then she sets up Reflect really bad, but we can get critical hits, and we manage to knock her out. And that didn't even look particularly hard. But now it's on to Giovanni. Giovanni is not just a gain of one or two levels, no, we had to gain 15 additional levels, getting all the way to level 70 to get through this fight. And it all comes down to the fact that Rage Strats just don't really work here. He's going to be using Double Team with the Persian, and once we get to the Rhydon, it does basically no damage. So we have to use Psy Wave Strats. But Psy Wave just wasn't doing enough damage together with its low accuracy. We have to get really lucky rolls, and we have to just get them all to hit. So it takes four hits just to take down that Persian, now we're on to the Needle Queen, where I'm using Psy Wave again. We missed the first one. We get hit with a Thunder that didn't do too much damage, but we managed to get the roll finally to get a three hit KO there. Now on the Needle King, we get a really good first roll, a meh second roll, but we knock it out in three hits. We're all the way to the ride on. We just need to avoid like a big earthquake or something like that. And here he tries to use Horn Drill. So we take him down in three hits. There we go, we've beaten all eight gyms. Now it's on to the rival number six fight. And this one, yet again, isn't super easy. I had multiple resets here, but it basically comes down to using Rage. And we really want him to use Fury Swipes. Fury Swipes will just build up our Rage very quickly, and then we can pretty much just knock out the Execute. We didn't quite get the one hit, but we got it in a two hit. Now we get to the Cloyster, it uses Clamp, but that's fine, it's just gonna get us to our maximum attack stat. Our attack stat's already basically up to 900 at this point, and it means that we're doing about as much damage as we could ever hope to do with this move Rage. It's still not a one hit KO on the Kadabra, it's a two hit KO, but we have plenty of health left on the Flareon and we one shot it. So all that remains is the Elite Four. Let's see if we can go ahead and beat Lorelei. So here, this is the first attempt against Lorelei, and I'm just going to use Rage. We found at the end of the Rosador race, when we did 50 base power moves with Mewtwo, that actually we can easily beat Lorelei with this move. It's not really even difficult. You just use Rage, and none of her moves do enough damage to a Mewtwo, 
everything that she has that's strong is basically special and she can use things like spike cannon that just build our rage quite a bit. Same for clamp, it's just going to build rage up and allow us to do a lot more damage. So we knock it out. Now we're on to Slowbro, it's looking like a 3 hit KO here but Surf does basically nothing, it turns out to be a 2 hit after the Surf. We one shot the Jinx, we're all the way to the final Lapras so if we just don't get frozen, no problem, we take her down on the first attempt. So Lorelei goes down and it's time to move on to Bruno. Now the Bruno fight can be hard because we can't just go for rage strats here. We don't do enough damage to his Pokemon. So we have to use Psy Wave and Psy Wave is just random. If we get bad rolls, we're not gonna win, but we can get good rolls like this one on Hitmonchan and as long as we hit it one more time, it goes down. But in Pokemon Yellow, Bruno does use double team with the Hitmons, which is very, very trolly. We do finally land the hit now on the Hitmonlee, we actually want to use Counter. All of its attacking moves are normal or fighting type, which means we can always return damage, and if he uses an item, you can actually use Counter, and it will just use whatever the last damage he did was. So we knocked that one out with Counter Strats. Now back to Psy Wave on the second Onyx. It turns out to be a two-hit KO right there. And finally, we're on to Machamp. Machamp also only uses physical moves. We could use Counter Strats here, I decided to go for Psy Wave instead, and we finally get the range to knock him out at level 75. Now against Agatha, we are taking her on at level 75. Now, I tried it at this level at the end of the 50 base power moves only Mewtwo run, and basically, it just comes down to the ranges that you get from Psywave. You can get really, really good rolls, and you can get through this at a pretty decent level, or you can get really, really bad rolls, and even at level 100, you just never get through this fight. It's completely random. and. You don't have the option to use something like Rage. I mean, Bide Strats could be used here, but they're really bad. You don't have enough HP to get through all five of her Pokemon if you're just going Bide the whole time. And the fact that she confuses you just makes that terrible. But here we're all the way to the final Gengar. We get put to sleep. It's using Psychic and Confuse Ray, which is just terrible. It even Dream Eaters us. None of these moves are going to do a lot of damage to a Mewtwo. But that's not the point. We're just getting whittled down because we can't do anything. And it's just keeping us completely incapacitated. But we finally take her down when we're at about half health. It's on to Lance. Now Lance was the point where I had to use all of my rare candies because we weren't getting through this at level 75. Here at level 87, I could go for Rage on the first Gyarados. And it's doing decent damage, he did use a Hyper Potion there, but we're able to get through that first Pokemon no problem. Now these Dragonairs are two hit KOs, they use Hyper Beam, it's perfectly fine though. We have so much HP and defense from all the badge boosts that we've gotten that we're basically fine. Now, the Aerodactyl's not going to take a ton of damage from Rage, but it only hits a wing attack here, and we're able to knock it out in three hits. Onto the Dragonite, where it's trying to use moves like Thunder, which basically do nothing, so it's another three hit KO. We've taken down Lance, and it's time for the champion. So I'm here against the champion at level 87 and I'm just really hoping that I don't have to go grind more levels in order to get through this fight. 
It's already just terrible. This has taken over four hours to get to this point in real time, playing at four times speed. And we have the worst score ever in one of my runs. But here I think Rage will be enough. We take an Earthquake from the Sand Slash, it doesn't do that much damage, and then it uses Fury Swipes, which is exactly what we wanted to see, to get all of those attack boosts, so we knock it out in three hits. Then it's going to be a two-hit KO on Alakazam, even though it used to recover, didn't matter. Now we have Exeggutor in a two-hit KO range, and we can move on to Magneton. Yet again, it's a two-hit KO at this point, so we can just knock it out onto the Cloister, it's using Spike Cannon. Perfect. We like the fact that we've got 999 attack, and if we can just land the hits, we should just win. Cloister goes down. It's on to the final Flareon. It hits a Flamethrower. Doesn't really matter. It's a two-hit KO, and we have beaten the champion at level 87. Now, interestingly, we beat the game at level 87 with this terrible moveset. But that's actually the same level that we beat the game with only 20 base power moves. And it kind of makes sense. In every fight that we could use just Rage, which is a 20 base power move, we just used it. And in any case where we couldn't use that move, we basically had to level up a ton of times in order to get through the fights. But what this tells us is that the floor for a really strong Pokemon is still less than level 100 to beat the game in most cases. Even if we gave intentionally terrible moves, you would be eventually able to get through the game with these types of Pokemon. So while Mewtwo is the worst Pokemon on the tier list, it kind of proves that Mewtwo is completely broken. So anyway, I hope you guys really enjoyed. If you did, like and subscribe. If you really want to support the channel, you can always join the channel memberships or there's a Patreon linked in the description. But with that being said, let's just get to the final test. Which one of these Pokemon can beat Mewtwo the fastest? So as both of our challengers take on Mewtwo, Mewpoo is going to start off with the Rage Strat, seeing if it can just knock out this Pokemon by just hitting it enough times. Meanwhile, Godcarp gets easily one-shot by the Mewtwo with a single Psychic. The whole idea here is to put this Mewtwo to sleep see if we can use Amnesia in order to get enough stat boosts in order to eventually get through it. But this could be incredibly luck based. Now, Mewpoo seems to be making decent headway if it can just get critical hits against the Mewtwo, it should be able to knock it out. But unfortunately, it just doesn't seem to be getting the luck that it needs. Mewtwo is using way too many recovers. Here, Godcarp has gotten Mewtwo to sleep, but it is still struggling quite a bit because it's on very low health and it's outsped. We need Mewtwo to use lots and lots of barriers, basically. And maybe we can get the luck in order to get through that fight. But here, Mewpoo goes for Psy Wave in order to finish the fight against Mewtwo and finishes first, getting just a little bit of redemption Granted, it is at level 87, so it should be able to beat Mewtwo a lot easier, but it has at least finished that test faster than Godcarp. Godcarp is going to struggle, and this is pretty much true of any Pokemon on minimal battles. It's one of the reasons I like this final section, and uh, yeah, it's just a matter of getting the luck. Once we finally manage to get this Mewtwo to sleep, set up all the amnesias, and get enough hydro pumps on it without it waking up and with it just using barrier when it does wake up eventually we're able to do more than enough damage where we whittle it down and in spite of the fact that it wakes up it uses another barrier we just put it back to sleep with spore and we are able to finally land the hits so god carp has also beaten mewtwo so there we have it that is a race kind of between these two Pokemon, the best possible Magikarp, the worst possible Mewtwo. What did you think? Tell me in the comments. That's all I got for you guys. Thanks so much for watching. See you in the next video. Later.